I don't recall in my educational experience ever having a, um, a meeting quite like this, but then we've never been in the middle of a pandemic before either. And we very much appreciate uh, Dr. Era's offer of um, support and commitment to presenting to us this evening to answer some of your questions. Uh, I'd like to start with our acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional land of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, which is represented by the communities of Saugeen First Nation and Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation. We also think of the Métis Nation of Ontario, whose history and people are well represented in Bruce and Gray counties. And we would uh, like to start off with greetings from Director Lori Wilder. Lori? Thanks, Cynthia. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this meeting tonight. For some of you, today would have been your first day back, and I hope that it went really well. I have to set the rules and say, actually, we aren't having comments. Can I just ask everybody to mute, please? Thanks very much. On behalf of Blue Water District School Board, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Dr. R and his colleagues at Grey Bruce Public Health, who are taking time out of their very busy schedules to join us for this evening's session. During these challenging and uncertain times, there are understandably many questions that our staff have as we plan for the safe return to school. We are so appreciative to have Dr. Ara on hand to respond to some of these questions so that we have the facts and most up-to-date information during this very fluid situation. As part of our extensive planning this summer, our board has been very fortunate to be able to work closely with Dr. Ara and his public health team. The guidance and ongoing wealth of local data provided by our public health partners have been instrumental in shaping our plan for reopening our schools and work sites after several months of closure. It is important to remember that we are all in this together and have a shared role in making our school return a safe and successful one. It is my hope that this session will help to better inform all of us as we move along the path to reopening. I look forward to this evening's question and answer session and extend a warm welcome to our special guests from Grey Bruce Public Health, as well as our Blue Water staff who are joining us this evening. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lori. And um, I'm going to uh, introduce Dr. Era, and I'm, I'm going to read what I have been provided in terms of uh, his background. And then I'm going to tell you what I've learned about him in the short few months that we've been in a pandemic. So Dr. Era was appointed Medical Officer of Health in October of 2018. Uh, he first came to the Grey Bruce Health Unit in 2015 during his postgraduate training um, and following that working as a physician consultant. As well his, as his medical degree, Dr. Era completed postgraduate training in public health and preventative medicine and a master's in epidemiology and biostatistics. That comes in quite handy at this point in time. Um, he has worked on a variety of public health initiatives, including road safety, uh, nuclear emergency response planning in a very good area for that, health effects of wind farms, resource prioritization, electronic documentation implementation, climate change uh, mitigation, and the, the built environment. And he has served on multiple postgraduate committees that are leading and shaping Canadian public health research and education. Uh, Dr. Ayres strongly believes that knowledge through research empowers both the individual and the community. Um, but what I've also learned about Dr. Era is that um, first off, he's a dad and that the pandemic has uh, made it um, more challenging for him in terms of organizing his days to be able to spend time with his family. And he, he sounds like a very committed father in terms of the discussions, the brief discussions we've had. Um, he is, I would suggest, as steady as a rock which is something that we have certainly appreciated in terms of working with public health and having that calm voice of reason. And he's incredibly accessible and responsive. And uh, certainly in the initial few months when we were sending emails to him for support, he would be responding at all times of the night and day. I don't know that he actually slept much, but I think he compared it to be a be being a resident at that point in time. So he's been through an another residency at this point. 
So we very much welcome Dr. Era this evening. He's going to make a few remarks to start and then we'll move into the question period. So Dr. Era, I'll turn it over to you and thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you all uh, for, for the introduction. I'm quite honored and I should remember next time to probably shorten my bio when I send it. Um, um, I, I just want to start by thanking everybody around the table and reminding them uh, that their actions in the past four or five months have saved lives. I have no doubt in my mind from the data I see in front of me that when we have zero death in Gray Bruce, this is directly related to the um, investment that everybody around uh, had put into the response to the emergency whether it's the public, whether it's the group around the table here as individuals to protect their families and to protect the community or the different partners uh, in, in the system. And I see no reason why this commitment from everybody around the table would not continue going forward. From what I've seen, um, there, is, there is absolute commitment to health and protection and safety of the, the students in the schools and the staff in the schools. Um, I, I continue to be concerned. It's a pandemic. We haven't seen a pandemic of this caliber for the past 102 years. The last one claimed 50 million people worldwide, and that's a conservative estimate. And this one, we have seen how it's seeded the whole world and some countries that didn't have uh, the appropriate response uh, that have paid the painful price. In Gray and Bruce, we continue to have zero death. Just like if you take a pause and think of the zero death, this is an accomplishment. And when you generalize it on all the activities that we've been managing and looking at, we can manage it. It is manageable. And going forward, there, if, if you look at the higher picture, if you look at the middle picture on the lower picture on the ground, you can see that is uh, quite manageable. When you see studies from Australia, New Zealand, uh, Denmark, Sweden, countries that they, they opened their schools with the measures uh, based on science, they've had zero cases so far, despite the fact some schools opened through the summer. And we, we can achieve that scenario. Less than optimal school uh, countries, jurisdictions have had a number of, of cases. Um, I do believe we're going to be in, we're not going to be in the worst case scenario. And I do believe in Gray and Bruce, we're going to be in the best case scenario. We continue, if you look at the, you know, the level, the mid-level in the system or on the ground, public health will continue to provide information for you to make the decisions that are best for yourself as a person, your family, and for the community. And we will continue to monitor the situation. We will continue to collaborate with all partners around the table. Um, the organizations that you work in, have invested, whether it's schools or the entire board, have invested every minute in their time in the past few months to ensure safe reopening. And I can attest to it firsthand. You know, when I, when I was responding late at night, like uh, Cynthia, Cynthia rightly said, she actually was up at night and working and sending that email late at night. So I, I really cannot take any credit more than uh, the, the, the whole system and the organization and the uh, leaders in your community and your in, in your schools have invested. If you look at this, it's truly we're all in this together. I I, I heard this uh, statement a couple times today, and uh, you know if we repeat it over and over, we would not do it justice. It is actually all of us, and it's literally in your hands to ensure that you would be informed, know what you need to do as an ind individual, as a um, as, as an educator uh, from safety point of view to protect yourself, your colleagues and uh, the students and the community. And it is quite doable. I, I can go on and on, but I, I think uh, the, the most important aspect in this session is getting to your questions and hopefully trying to answer all of them in this session. And if not, we can follow up with individuals or uh, through a, commu a written communication for the answers as well. So I'll, I'll just turn it back and I really thank you for the introduction, Cynthia. 
Thank you, Dr. Era. And I should also mention that we do have with us this evening um, Andrea Riley, who is um, manager of public health, who's got responsibility for schools. So that we've been working closely with her as well. And Ian Reich, who is here this evening, is going to help moderate. Um, who's been working with Jamie Pettit around our communications and shared communications. So we had asked people to submit questions to us for this evening, and we provided those to uh, Ian and Dr. Era. Um, so um, Ian is going to moderate along with Jamie Pettit, our communications officer, and uh, walk through the questions that we have. Uh, if there's time remaining at, at that point in time, then we will take uh, qu further questions through the chat. And as Dr. Era has indicated, uh, you certainly can um, get those questions to us and we will share them with him afterwards and get responses that we can post to you. So Ian, lovely to have you here and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so as you stated, uh, we, we do have uh, quite a number of questions. So we will ensure that uh, we try to get through as many of them as possible. And we will also ensure that we provide a written responses to the questions that we are not able to get to, as well as uh, more than likely the questions that we do answer uh, here live for all those that are not able to be here. Uh, so first, um, I'll focus on questions that were more directed to Dr. Era, but uh, please, uh, from the school board, if you do have uh, um, more to add to the to the responses, uh, please chime in uh, once Dr. Era is uh, finished his response uh, prior to me moving on to the next question. Uh, so I'll just start in the order of the questions that were submitted. Uh, but Dr. Era, are you able to explain the difference in requirements throughout the province um, specifically in regards to uh, the one meter distancing versus the two meter distancing uh, in, in, the, in the classrooms uh, in particular, um, the difference between the messages that we do have for the general public about two meters versus um, the potential for a one meter distance within the classrooms. Certainly, so the, the physical distancing is one of the most important measures in reducing transmission. There is nothing magical about the number two meters. Uh, the recommendation from World Health Organization is to keep a distance of one meter or more if possible. And again, the condition if possible. World Health Organization designs the recommendation for the whole world and there's different built environment in different countries. In, in North America, the built environment, the environment that we use, we live in, that we, we design, has more space to everything we do. And that's why we went with the recommendation in general, two meters. However, again, there's no magic about it. It's a spectrum. If a person can keep the, the two meters, or, or doesn't mean that they're not, they're not exposed to risk. And it is one intervention of many. There are many layers of intervention, washing hands, uh, screening kids before coming to schools, uh, uh, frequently disinfecting high traffic areas. All of them are in place to add uh, risk mitigation. So if the two meters didn't exist uh, in all scenarios, that does not mean the plan has failed at all. And we've seen this in, in dental offices, in clinics, where there is literally zero distance between the patient and the physician, uh, as long or the dentist, as long as a person is following the recommendation, wearing their PPEs, washing their hands, and minding their distance to the best of their ability, we're still protected. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, from the school board, if you do have anything to add, please chime in. Um, so and the next question is, other boards are making masks mandatory for grades one and up. However, there is a, a difference here in, in Great Bruce. I'm wondering if you're able to explain uh, the reasons why uh, we didn't make uh, masks mandatory, let's say, from grade one and up uh, and chose more senior years to make them mandatory. So the science about using masks in pandemic in public places or in schools um, has uh, has has a recommendation that could be different from what you've seen in implementation. Uh, more specifically, the recommendation from CDC Atlanta, Center of Disease Control, one of the most credible public health organizations, is to encourage students and families to use masks, never to mandate it. The word mandate has not been said in in recommendation. And th there, is, there are many reasons for it, uh, depending on the age of the kid, their reliability and understanding the, the information, their re reliability in uh, executing tasks. If you give a mask to a kid uh, three years old, like my daughter, 
She loves masks and she wears them for five minutes, then they're everywhere except her face. And, you know, if even if the kid wore it in, in grade one or two, if they don't wear it correctly, they're going to be touching their faces quite often, more frequently, increasing the chance of risk of transmission. Many other variables come in the equation that will indicate best practice in science. Do not mandate it in schools, rather encourage it whenever possible. When you see the recommendation from different jurisdictions, it's, it's different. That's really depending on, on the jurisdiction and the epidemiology and many other variables. In, in Ontario, to my delight, I have not seen the word mandated in any document that came from the province. The word required for, uh, for up and the uh, word encouraged or um, uh, recommended for, for younger ages. At the, bo- at, the, at the end of the day, this, this is a science, this is a regulation. In practice, if there is a family or a student willing and able to do it correctly, that's great. If not, it is literally a small fraction of the layers of protection. And there's no need to penalize the kid or the family or be anxious about it. The protection from masks is 5 to 10% max if everybody masks. And nobody masked, it is 5 to 10% less. So if there are a few kids who didn't mask, it would not change the risk in general practically. Perfect. Thank you so much for that response. Um, what distance should students be maintaining in the classroom? And what is uh, this um, physically, imp- what if it is physically impossible due to the size of the space available? So personal distancing, very challenged in tighter spaces. Uh, what would be some recommendations for uh, that you could provide? The It's similar to the first question. And uh, you, I can add to it that the plans that the school has worked on and refined and refined and went through more revision would have um, considered almost every activity in the school. And there are many layers of protection, whether it's watching, washing hands frequently and um, wearing PPEs, screening for students. So if the distance is not maintained as two meters or one meter in all settings, it again does not mean that there is no protection. There are still all these layers of protection. What could be done, many, many interventions to ensure the two meters, uh, and most of them or all of them have been utilized in the plans, um, whether it's uh, arranging them, arrange the, the chairs in a, in a certain way, facing one direction, wearing PPEs to everybody if, if possible, um, uh, teachers, uh, staff wearing surgical uh, level face shield, all these things together would ensure safety in, in the plan. Perfect. Thank you uh, so much. Um, these, these next two questions are also somewhat related uh, to that as well, um, but they, they pertain particularly to um, the number of children in a classroom. So uh, the question in particular, how can students and staff be safe when the number of students in a classroom is not specifically limited? Um, I, I, I think your, your previous response pretty much does cover most of that. I don't know if you have anything to add to that question. Yeah, I I can add to that. Early in the summer, we worked on three plans, and that was the direction from the ministry, rightly so. And still, although it's not in the guideline, it still stands. The work is still there. The three plans would go from complete shutdown and remote teaching if the situation was dire to complete opening if the situation was uh, favorable and a modified plan in the middle that would have all the interventions that I mentioned. So currently, we have a very favorable epidemiology. This is as good as it gets. I have no doubt we're going to be seeing sporadic cases here and there. But again, I I have full confidence we'll be able to manage it without turning into outbreaks. And when I say me, uh, we, I mean uh, public health. I I mean uh, the school, the staff, the students, the community. So when you put all these things together, uh, we have favorable epidemiology that allows us to open completely And we also have the modification, sorry, the measures that would have been for modified access. Modified access means 50% of the class. So we have the measures as if we are in a situation that is medium severity, and we're not. So again, uh, the number of students in class, if everybody's there, 
And even if they're hugging each other and there's no case in the community and there's low risk in, in, in uh, transmission to school, that's still uh, you know, an acceptable risk. But we're not willing to take it. We're willing to go and we want to go all the way conservative to implement the, all these measures with having uh, a reasonable number of people. Um, if the class is, is whatever it is, we will try to minimize it and we've been trying to minimize it to the acceptable level. Thank you for that. Um, the next question, it, it's quite a long one, so, so bear with me, but it is uh, specifically related to cohorts and contacts. Um, so the ministry guidance document indicates that elementary uh, students should have no more than 50 direct or indirect contacts. Please give me an example of an indirect contact. That's the first part. Uh, but for example, if a student in a class of 25 plus the teacher has siblings in a class of 20, plus the teacher, does that mean they have each have 45 contacts? They ride a bus with 30 students, um, dot, dot, dot. And what if their music teacher teaches more than 90 students as well? Um, so it's quite a complex question, but looking at uh, the further you go down your contact chain, the potential for them to grow significantly. Uh, but can you give a specific example, I guess, of what an indirect contact Certainly. So I, I was told by a mentor a long time ago that uh, complex questions have very simple answer that does not work. So the, the answer would have to be complex. And, and, and the short of it, uh, no, the number of contacts would not be the additive of everybody in the class and the ad addition of people in, in, um, on a bus. Uh, this, these, although they seem complex, they're actually simplification of the assessment that we run on every person whenever there is a case or probable case. The direct contact would be a person standing in front of another person within you know, a meter or so and talking for over 15 minutes. That's a lot of contact. Uh, to give you an example, uh, I'll go on a little detour, come back to the question. Uh, there was a, a suspect outbreak in the hospital, two cases, uh, in the, one in the AR, and uh, one in, in the ward, and there was contact among them, one healthcare worker, the other person is uh, a very young child or, or baby, less than six months. So when we asked the hospital occupational health to send us the potential contact to, uh, to assess whether they're direct close contact or not, their assessment was 70 people on the ward, 70 healthcare providers. When we assessed the risk of each one of them, we tested zero. There was no close contact, although some of them actually touched the baby, worked with the baby for, for a period of time. They were wearing their PPEs. They washed their hands before and after. There is no risk there. And now we have the luxury of time looking back, seeing that that assessment was right. There were no cases developed in that cohort of 70 people, zero testing. Similarly, when you go here, there are 50 direct, 50 indirect, these are oversimplification of the assessment. If there is a case in a class of 15 people, kids, that doesn't mean all of them are close contact and need to be tested and they're going to be getting the virus. Probably out of 15, if it's an age around 10, which is there is enough reliability, not much, you're going to still see one or two close contact. The two kids who are favorite or are best friends with that kid who use the same toys who actually were caught a few times just like laughing without the PPEs and, and uh, just doing everything they shouldn't. Those might be considered close contacts. The rest of the class would be completely indirect according to these definitions. However, again, these are oversimplifications. It will be very exceptional if you would consider closing a class or closing a school would be extremely exceptional. Thank you very much for that. Um, the next question is more pertaining to casual workers. Um, how, or, how will it work when you are a temporary casual person and you go from one school to another school? Will we be limited to work at a certain school or schools? And what is the risk in working at more than one school? A really good question. Part of it is really administrative and, and the policies in the school would dictate this. The, the science uh, part of it, or the risk evaluation part of it, is uh, the, the less facilities a person would work in, the less risk of 
um, contamination or transmission. Uh, however, really, do we have to have every person working in the same facility? That was not the case when we were in the middle of the first wave and long-term care needed uh, staff. So the staff from the hospital, which is a very high risk institutions, were deployed into the long-term care. Um, again, balancing, uh, reducing risk with practicality is the key. And it's not, uh, it's not the end of the world if a person worked in two or three places. As long as they're uh, following the direction from public health and the recommendation, washing their hands, following uh, all the, the precautions that we would expect them to, to have and, and implement in their practice, uh, the risk is controllable. And again, we have the track record looking back 128 uh, cases uh, even some of these uh, facilities where these cases work, whether a restaurant or a or, or, uh, grocery store, they don't have the level of rigor in plans that are implemented in the schools. And we have seen zero transmission to co-workers in 128 investigations. Just remember, zero transmission. It's quite doable in a restaurant, in a grocery store. It is very doable in a controlled environment like school where everybody in the school and and the executive in the school have implemented every measure there is and invested every minute they had. Thank you very much for, for that response. Um, next question is, I'm curious how you interpret the differences in risk between elementary students, between what they will encounter compared to their older secondary age siblings moving into face-to-face -face learning as secondary students see one teacher per week and are in cohorts of 15 students, while elementary students see multiple teachers per day and are in a class of anywhere between 17 and 35 students. Does this concern you in the light of the possibility of generating a second wave? Uh, good, good points in this question. It's just connecting them all to connect them to a second wave. That part is, is, uh, is, is um, it's just difficult to predict from anybody uh, whether there's going to be a second wave or not. Uh, you know, if I if I was able to answer that, uh, um, that will be very impressive. I would I would have a Nobel Prize definitely. Um, but the first parts, there is definitely a risk, and it's rightly said the different ages and the different activity. However, it's really part of the many factors uh, in in a, in a bigger picture. Uh, we look at the number of people in a limited amount of space. We look at the time window interaction among them, and we look at the uh, modified environment, how many measures are in place to mitigate risk. So I can be carrying uh, a baby who has COVID and who's coughing over me all day, as long as I'm wearing my PPE and I'm washing my hands before and after. My risk is not there. I would not be considered a close contact. But at the same time, you, know, you can have a, a person who's very aware all the time and, and uh, without the measures around them, you cannot really say uh, that they're not close contact if the measures that we are, have in our plans is not there. There are many variables in the picture. You listed in the question five and six, the six could be one of the five. However, um, th this is really under um, oversimplification of the picture. Am I concerned? I am concerned about every aspect of, of school uh, planning. And I know everybody around the table is concerned. And I know the person who asked the question is concerned as well. And this is good. Concern is, is what's going to generate enough interest and engagement from all of us to mitigate that situation, no matter what it is. Again, I'm, I'm answering with a very general uh, answer. However, the situation is general. It, that The risk is, is never going to be zero even if the person is in their own home and never left home. As long as somebody's bringing them food, there is risk. However, the risk is not gonna be uh, measured by uh, one snip. Times, there is uh, more chance I'm gonna be not careful in, in one of them. Again, it's really difficult to look at one snap in time and one activity and say, is this concerning? 
All right, thank you very much. Um, so on to the next question. Uh, what will be the protocol if a child comes to school with symptoms? That is the question, the most important question, and it's gonna be uh, an issue for, for many people of us. So the more we know about it, the better we will be prepared. If, if somebody had symptoms, they will be screened by their parents or themselves, and they should not come to school. And if they weren't sure or they weren't following the recommendation or were you know, not mindful of this and they happen to be in school, uh, there, are, there are many checks and balances in place to ensure uh, these symptoms would come to the attention of somebody. And as soon as they're identified, they'll be sent home. First step, get them out of the school and get them assessed by a healthcare provider, which could be their family physician, could be uh, the assessment centers, one of the assessment centers that will be very available for this, and we're working with the healthcare system on ensuring capacity, could be assessment through public health, and we will have uh, nurse, public health nurses in schools who would work on coordinating care. So there are many teams behind them, and there will be the coordinators. Could they be involved in this? Could be. Could I be involved in this if it need to be timely? Yes. Uh, the the main, the first step is to get them out of the school, and to get them assessed by the healthcare provider. It's important. It's, it's of a critical importance for anybody who works in school is not to make clinical or medical recommendation. That's going to confuse the the parents. Send different messaging. A healthcare provider can assess them and say, this is not COVID for this reason or that reason. And at the end of that would be, everything is, is done if it's ruled out. If they're not able to rule it out, the person will be tested or recommended testing. And until the result comes back, we're gonna treat the situation as a case, as a positive case until ruled out. So we will assess, public health will assess the risk of the family all of them will be in isolation until the test comes back, usually. We'll assess the risk within the class and the close contacts. And again, there are not going to be everybody in the class. Every person will be assessed. And we will work with the school officials to get this assessment completed, to know what kind of activities the kids have, what age, what reliability. And uh, if there are any symptoms, any person will be, again, isolated, I mentioned, and, and the whole cascade will happen. If a person refuse testing or couldn't tolerate testing, they will be in isolation for 14 days. And their close contacts from school and family will be for 14 days. This is very conservative. This is a conservative approach, but it is the approach that we have in place to ensure zero transmission in every case that we've managed so far. And some of these, I, I should have mentioned, some of these scenarios out there uh, that we managed are way higher risk than than a controlled environment like the school with the plans that you have. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question is actually in relation, the next three are actually in relation to about uh, a potential confirmed case. What happens if there is a confirmed case? So what protocol um, will there be uh, if for a class that ends up with a confirmed case? If there's one case, will the school be closed and move to online learning? Or what is that threshold? Um, why is a long-term care facility considered to be an outbreak with one case, but not a school? All good questions. If there is one confirmed case, we will treat it similar to what I just described for a suspect case. If we're suspecting it is case, we're going to implement all the measures until it's ruled out. The, uh, um, if, if there is a positive case, there will be announcement, timely an announcement as soon as we can to inform the, the public that there is a case in, in the school. We will be cognizant uh, at all times of privacy to the best of our ability. We will assess the close contacts. And again, this is already done. Remember, if, if, if there is a symptom, the person left home, we assess this. So when the result comes back after three days, this is already completed three days ago. And, and uh, we will assess again uh, the close contacts. We will ask them to be tested and isolated. People who are not close contact will be asked to monitor, self-monitor. Um, and, and remember, whenever we discover a case, the infection happened two weeks ago. So there is no panic about closing the school to disinfect it. 
disinfecting after the discovery of a case is futile. And, and the reason is the window of time has lapsed. The virus survives maximum 24 hours. So if a student was coughing on every service surface in, in the class, by two days, those by 24 hours, overnight, the viruses are not there. So disinfection and cleaning is essential to be ongoing, but not after the case is, or because the case was discovered. The last part of the question, why the definition of an outbreak in school is different from the long-term care? And it is based on the risk assessment. People who are in long-term care are resident there. They never left the place. So if there is a case, it was acquired within the long-term care. And the definition of the outbreak, the underlying principle among all definitions of outbreak in a facility is the evidence of transmission within the facility. So again, one person in a long-term care means somebody infected them there because they never left the long-term care. Versus in a school, if you find uh, two people infect, infected there or three, but there is no connection between them whatsoever. There is no uh, evidence of transmission. And this is the same thing in, in, in hospitals. We found two, uh, two cases Although there was connection between them, there was no further transmission. So there was no evidence of transmission within the hospital. And that's the technical part of it. Regardless, we are treating every day in the school as it is an outbreak. All these measures are in place, indicating that we're treating every one of us as a case. And, we're, and, and probably that's one, is one underlying principle that's useful for all of us if we can be mindful. The word mindful is to be top mind. If you consider yourself a case, asymptomatic case, and you treat everybody around you with the same uh, carefulness that you would if you are a case, you're going to protect yourself, people around you, your family, the community. Again, a bit of labor to answer, Ian. Remind me with time, so I might go over. No worries at all. I think that question deserves that that uh, bit of uh, detail and conversation. Um, so what protocol, what will be the protocol, let's say, if a prep teacher who has contact with many students in a school has COVID? So very much related to the previous question, but more so now as a teacher that sees lots of children is positive with COVID. Any difference? Uh, technically, from risk point of view, uh, there there are differences in the final assessment. However, it's the same principles. Like if, if, we're, if we're with a teacher or a school staff, we have reliability with the answers. If you ask a, a child, have you done this? Uh, how many times were you careful with the PPE? Any answer they're going to give us is, is under question. Is it reliable or not? With the school staff, definitely uh, th there is reliability. So that, that part of the assessment would make it easier. If there is a school teacher or staff who actually dealt with many kids, but they were wearing the PPEs, washing their hands at all times, wearing uh, a mask, and they're keeping that distance to the best of their ability, the risk of transmission to the kids does not mean that everybody in the class is going to be uh, tested. And if, if they did everything by the book and they're consistent in it, uh, probably there is no need for to test anybody or send them home, just monitor them for symptoms. And, and it's worth mentioning there that, um, you know, there are countries, again, I mentioned before, Sweden, Denmark, um, New Zealand, had zero cases in schools, although they operated for weeks or months. So this is quite doable and manageable. And I realize that uh, the, the, all the questions that we're going to probably hear, they, they have that element of concern, which is great. This is what we need to have. But at the same time, we need to fulfill this concern with facts. If we uh, start mixing facts with fiction, we really might have moved concern to, into anxiety, and anxiety is not the greatest uh, tool to use in emergencies. Perfect. Thanks for that. Um, and the next question is very much related as well, but I think it's a, another different scenario that I think uh, your response will provide some good clarity to. What will be the protocol um, if there is a confirmed case on a bus route or multiple bus routes, uh, a child that, you, that goes on multiple buses? Um, what would be the, the concern about that uh, students on a bus uh, testing positive? 
It, it is definitely a concern. And the bus environment is, is uh, less controlled than the class. The class, the, you know, the teacher would know the class, would know the level, what's going on in the bus. Things might, might go different ways. However, all the measures that I mentioned are still in place. Like just remember, screening of symptoms have happened before the kid arrived to school, happened during the day, and people are vigilant for it. So if everybody gets on the bus without symptoms, that, that's a really optimal scenario. Nevertheless, the question starts with a symptom or a case on a bus. Uh, so every bus would have optimally uh, some distance between students, even if two, two people, two kids in one seat. If we ensure that students will be assigned seats, and this is something still in the making, uh, we, I have it actually on the agenda for tomorrow's meeting with the school boards. I mentioned to a few schools, but not to everybody. If we assign seats to students, that means each student will have um, a number of people around them. And those people are, are limited in number, as I mentioned, and uh, known. And, and if there is reliability with age and ability to, to comprehend and execute tasks, there, there should be not much risk to people around. But if you have a scenario of a kid who's too young and touching everything around them, touching everybody around them, uh, it will be maximum of three people, the one beside them, the one in front of them, the one behind them. Uh, it's, the, the virus does not fly through the bus. It's not, it's, it has wings and, and legs and starts jump, jumping on people. Some of, the, some of the questions I've heard from different uh, public or, or individuals in, in Grey Bruce over the pandemic really comes from the fact, is it going to jump on people more or less? And it's not. I can, I can have this Kleenex all day if it's filled with viruses and I'm touching it all day, I'm still washing my hands. I'm not going to be infected. Similarly, it's the three people around them and we would have uh, ability to trace. If there are different uh, buses, a person moving from bus to bus, again, if we ensure that assignment to students to seats, that will be optimal to trace the trip uh, with limited number of people. Thank you for that uh, response. Uh, this question is a bit longer as well, so bear with me. Um, although children seem to not get as sick with COVID as adults or are asymptomatic, isn't the transmission just the same? Meaning, in my opinion, children tend to spread germs and sickness rapidly compared to adults. So doesn't that place all adults in school at greater risk? Most kids have been quarantined or kept in small bubbles. What happens when they all get together? Will it be too late? How are we preventing this from happening using this current model? So the risk of transmission in, in kids is not fully known. It's a, it's a novel virus from that point of view. In general, kids transmit disease to, to people around them more than adults. Uh, there has been uh, recent studies looked at and evaluated by CDC Atlanta uh, saying kids from 10 and above are able to transmit like adults. Younger kids in another study uh, have very high level of virus in their uh, uh, nostril, um, in their nostrils. So does this mean that they're transmitting more? We don't know this. There is difference between high level of viral load and high level of transmission. We would know this. Um, when, when some of the studies in the states completed in, in the coming weeks or, or uh, months. Um, I'm not aware of, of uh, studies in Canada that would evaluate that, that type of risk. Regardless, if you, if you plan uh, reopening schools like we are, we don't go with the best case scenario, whether the kid is transmitting or not. We go with the worst case scenario, the most conservative scenario. And even if there is a kid shedding the virus, very, very, I should say that if, if the virus, if the person does not have symptoms, there is evidence that the shedding window of time is uh, minimal and the uh, number of viruses shed is also minimal, which, which is the infectivity. So there has been much concern about asymptomatic cases. However, the evidence is clear. They are not the driver of the outbreak. They're not the driver of the outbreak. 
regardless of the age, we're treating every case as very infectious and the protocols in place to ensure safety. So again, I, I'm concerned about every scenario. However, the scenarios listed in the question are quite manageable as well. Perfect, thank you. Um, next question is, I work in a school and my child attends a different elementary school. What happens if either one of our buildings or classrooms contracts the virus? Do we both need to quarantine for 14 days? That will be extremely exceptional that if there is a case in a school, everybody will quarantine for 14 days. If a person is close contact, and that's a definition based on assessment done by public health, public health only, and it's worth mentioning here, I want to emphasize it. You might hear during the pandemic going forward, many opinions from family physician, from assessment center, from whomever it is, although medical, the assessment of close contact comes from public health team, only public health team. And, and this is crucial not to uh, cause anxiety and undue panic in the community. Uh, so if you hear of a case in your school or in your, in your class or in your kid's class, and you don't receive a call from public health on the same day within hours, that is a very good day. It means your risk was assessed and you don't have the risk there. Again, remember, if there is a case in a class or a school, there's no need to panic. That, that transmission happened 15 days ago, 15 or more when the person was infected until they're diagnosed 15 days ago. And if a person did not receive a call from public health, that's all they need to know, that they don't have risk. We will communicate with the school. We would announce that there was a case. If you don't hear it from us, it's probably a rumor. Um, again, that, that's in general for that question. Thank you very much. This next question has multiple components, so I'll probably go one step at a time um, and you can provide a response. Um, they should be fairly brief, I believe. Uh, so what is the current wait time for getting results of a COVID test? It varies depending on the pressure on the system, on the lab system. In March and April, it was maximum two days. If it is high sensitive area like uh, school or long-term care, uh, long-term care was 24 hours or less. Um, it's, sorry, this is a point to Ian, you want a clear, quick answer. This is really important. If the system goes to testing people without symptoms, you know, uh, random testing to mass testing, that's gonna stall the system. And that, uh, it's just worth mentioning, it's not recommended by public health, not recommended by science. When you hear that you know bulk of people were tested with no symptoms, that test adds no extra benefit. There is no reassurance in it. All it means, on the day a person was tested, they were not shedding the virus. They could be carrying it, and there has been cases where the very next day a person became ill and tested positive, although they had a negative test. Uh, and there is a potential for false positives. So again, I would urge everybody around the table to remember this. If you don't remember anything, if you don't remember my name by the end of this, please remember testing everybody for the sake of testing is wrong. It's just flat out wrong, not scientific and dangerous. Thank you very much. Um, is it possible for families to be tested for COVID without traveling to one of the assessment or testing centers? It is possible, yes. Uh, we have uh, different uh, healthcare providers in the system, assessment centers, uh, family uh, health teams, some of them provide the testing. Uh, we have worked during the first wave, our, our team, the SWAP team, a uh, group of nursing to provide specific care for people who cannot mobilize. It's not open for everybody. Rather, if somebody has a real reason not able to leave their house, we'll get to them. And we worked with the EMS uh, from Gray to deliver similar services. However, um, you know, it, we would depend on the assessment center in general to deliver this uh, uh, this uh, type of service. I'm curious if the person who asked the question can provide more information in the chat box on why uh, not going to the assessment center. Is it worry about the risk of transmission there, or it's a different uh, reason? Uh, Dr. Yeah, Mira, if, if I can just uh, uh, bring more to the table, we've had a couple of questions from schools actually 
um, with parents that are concerned about accessing testing, but they have um, they do not drive and have no car, so they can't get to an assessment center. Thank you. Uh, nobody will be left behind. There are different services in the system, and I will spare no effort in advocacy or even ordering if the need be um, to, to get the test done as soon as we can, because the cost of it is to hold many people for 14 days uh, in isolation. And that's not something I'm willing or anybody around the table willing to wait for. Thank you very much for that. Uh, next question is, if a student is kept home from school for symptoms that could be COVID or could be a number of other common illnesses, can we accept the child back into the school as soon as the symptoms are gone? Or should we be holding out for a negative COVID test? And what are the privacy implications of asking to see medical information like a COVID test result? Very good questions. Uh, return to school based on symptoms, uh, symptom free is, is not uh, the, the uh, practice, not the better practice. We need to rule it out by healthcare provider or assessment from public health. Uh, there, it could be allergies, it could be strep throat, and you can do the test for strep throat, it's positive. We know it's not COVID. Uh, if there is no test in place, the person will be uh, in isolation for 14 days and uh, their family will be in isolation, close contact. Close contact within the class will be also uh, treated as, as exposed and needing to be tested or, or uh, wait for 14 days. There was a second part of it, Ian, if you can repeat it, please. Definitely. So, um, and what are the privacy implications of asking to see a medical uh, information like a COVID test result? So I think that this person is assuming that perhaps they would be the one that would want to see that negative test result. Um, if you can just comment on that. Uh, sharing personal health information has never been good practice and has, you know, has not been in our system for, for years. Uh, whenever any one of us is sick and want to take a leave of absence for sickness, all we need to provide is a medical note saying there is a medical reason. Even the diagnosis is not known. Uh, people need to be reassured 200% that if there is a case and they're positive or there is no clear negative, they're not going to go back to school. Public health will ensure this would not happen. And if somebody showed up back in school, means by definition, they have been cleared by public health. And we will have that communication with the school officials to, to ensure that you know, cases are in isolation. We actually follow up with the case on a daily basis. And if there is any indication of reliability issues, we pay them visit, door knocks. And if there is evidence of you know, contesting the isolation, uh, we have uh, the right to involve the police and we have involved it in a couple of cases uh, so far. Uh, we take no risk if there is a case uh, to have any contact with the public. Again, it's not the right of anybody to know the, uh, the diagnosis of anybody else if there is no added benefit. Uh, again, we already control it and we ensure the privacy with the control. Perfect, thank you. Um, next question is, uh, when schools closed for an extended March break, the daily case numbers were lower in, that, in, in this province. We are reopening with higher daily numbers currently. What will be the determining factor to safety, safely reopening um, or closing in the future? We look at uh, three main sets of data. One of them is the epidemiology, which is the number of cases doubling time, the increase in the cases exponentially in time, the capacity in hospital, capacity in testing, the percent positive, uh, many indicators related to epidemiology. We look at second set of indicators, which is related to compliance from the public, how much uh, compliance and engagement from the public there is and the third one is consistency with other parts of, of the uh, system. Um, for example, if, if other health units around us had uh, severe outbreaks and we don't, that does not mean we're going to continue. 
that's an alarming enough situation that there could be a spillover. So these are the three main sets of data and we monitor them on, on daily basis. We continue to evaluate them. The compliance data comes from many partners around the table. I meet with, uh, I, during the first wave, I, I met on daily basis with, uh, with many partners, weekly basis with the uh, municipalities, with the police, EMS, fire, and uh, the, the media is, is being examined by, by our um, communication team, social media, and the public. Uh, so again, we, we get this communication on continuous basis and uh, we, we ensure you're gonna be informed about it. Thank you for that. Um, what protocols for shoes, coats, backpacks, and other clothing have that, that have been worn to school um, are we going to have? Should shoes and backpacks um, not be entering our homes? Do we need to wash coats on a daily basis if they have been hanging in a classroom or in the hallway? Uh, there is no need to have that level of concern and uh, cleaning uh, related to objects. The, the uh, disease is droplet uh, uh, transmitted and there is evidence of transmission of vomitized uh, transmission, which is uh, uh, transmission from touching surfaces and objects. Usually surfaces like plastic or iron would have higher chances of transmission. Fabric, clothes, shoes are, are not as much. And if they're hanging there, really does not mean that people are coughing on them continuously. That's what would be concerning. Uh, the virus will be destroyed by time within hours, maximum 24 hours early in the outbreak. In the pandemic, we had information to go with uh, maximum two to three days on plastic and iron surfaces. However, the evidence was clear that you can find genetic material that's going to trigger the test. However, that genetic material is not uh, able to transmit disease or uh, infect. So again, you leave clothes over, uh, overnight, uh, there will be disinfected by time. If they're hanging in the school in, in an area where nobody's you know, touching them, coughing on them, there is no risk there for transmission. Thank you. Um, next question obviously does come from someone that is, is quite concerned, but uh, as a diabetic, are there any other precautions to take other than just wearing a mask and washing our hands? It's an excellent question. So there are people with vulnerabilities and, and for each person with such vulnerability, they need to um, connect with their healthcare provider to assess their own unique situation. Diabetes has two types. One of them is high risk. The other one is not proven to be high risk. The, the, uh, the, the uh, diabetic that diabetes that comes with uh, in childhood and requires insulin it probably is high risk. However, it's not proven yet to be high risk. Um, can they do more? Being mindful, washing hands, keeping distance, washing, uh, watching, uh, wearing a mask correctly, all these things need to be done. Um, however, it, it's you know a personal, uh, individual decision that needs to be assessed on case-to-case -case basis. Um, and, and it's difficult to have a blanket answer to everybody there saying, if you have diabetes, don't go to school, or if you have diabetes, go to school. Uh, again, th that is difficult to, to uh, stereotype and just use. Thank you. Um, when, we, uh, when we return to school, I'm concerned about the impact all the protocols will have on young children, especially when children see their friends, but must remain physically distant and can no longer play together or share materials even outside. What do you foresee the short and long-term effects on their mental health will be, if any? That is definitely half the concern with COVID. Many people think that our mission is to shut everything down, minimize the risk. That is part of our mission. It's our mission when we, in the mitigation, March and April, in the reopening, half our concern is how can we get things open as soon as possible? So the measures from COVID are not gonna cause more disease. It wouldn't be a success by the end of the year if we have zero COVID and three deaths of suicide. It's just not a success. Um, so I, I am concerned about that part. Balancing the two, ensuring that kids go back full return to have that face-to-face, -face, uh, have activities that are safe to be provided instead of high uh, risk activity, that's a good balance approach. 
And, and again, every single activity has been evaluated from that point of view. What we can do for our kids, many things. We know that stress to kids can be long-term effect, could be short-term effect, could be both. And, and uh, we know that there is resilience to be built. Some people go through emergency or a crisis and they fall apart. Other people go out stronger. Spending time with kids. Um, forgive me getting technical here, but uh, cortisol is the hormone that would cause stress. And in stress, it goes up and it causes people to actually forget or have weaker memories, which is a blessing in a certain way. Uh, I, I've heard of a recent case where the kid was crying, just crying, 12 years old daughter, uh, uh, sorry, uh, girl, uh, crying. And she's saying to her parents, I don't know why I'm crying. And it's very obvious later after a bit chat, it's related to not seeing her, her friends. Uh, snug, um, hugging, getting closer, reading a book, snuggling with kids would, would uh, generate the opposite hormone uh, to cortisol. It's called oxytocin. It is the, the hormone that is produced in our brains when we feel love, trust, happiness. Those are essential to actually turn that uh, stressful situation into a bonding situation. And it would, again, we, we, if we can do more of this to our kids, this is a really good time to spend some time with them, read a book, sit on a couch, snuggle, talk with them, depending on the age of the kid. There are many things that we can do. And I know the school has many activities in place to, to ensure these things are, are done in one way or the other. Thank you. Um, next question is, is it safe for pregnant women to teach in person in the classroom or should they request online learning? Uh, pregnancy is high risk for COVID, definitely uh, proven for the uh, um, woman. For the fetus, there is no proof there is high risk. There, there is proof of infection during being a fetus. However, it's, it's not high risk at this point. Uh, for, for the woman herself, there is risk. Uh, does that justify working remotely? Possibly, depending, again, that's any question related to health really has to be evaluated by the healthcare provider because they know the, the holistic picture of their health, whether they have other conditions that would augment uh, the negative effects during pregnancy. Again, for, for any question related to this, please, I encourage you to go to your healthcare provider, your physician, your nurse practitioner, discuss these issues. Thank you very much. Uh, next question, I think you previously uh, somewhat answered. Um, how long does the virus live on paper? Should we restrict the amount of paperwork handed out to teacher or handed into teachers? Sorry. Uh, it lives on paper, definitely uh, hours on plastic and, and uh, um, uh, iron surfaces a bit longer, less than 24 hours on paper, less. If a uh, paper is to be handed to a teacher, probably a good practice to uh, put this paper on the side for a period of time, you know, 12 hours, 24 hours would be very conservative, 24 hours for paper, and washing hands before and after, leaving it, then using the paper after. Thank you very much. Next question is, you know, one I, I definitely uh, smiled reading. Um, I'm wondering if, Tin can phones used in kindergarten class would be a concern for transmitting the virus. The sound vibrations travel on the strings. It would allow us to distance students and build community, but would this be a concern or would the virus travel on the string? Teachers would in could ensure child only touches their can, but the string might be a concern. Uh. The only concern would be if the child is touching the can and speaking in it, then later somebody else touches it. However, if that's guaranteed not to be done, there is no risk with this activity. The virus does not travel, does not jump, does not fly. The virus, as a matter of fact, and some of the teachers around the table would probably teach me about this, the virus is a biological material. It's not a life organism. To meet the definition of life, any organism should have the ability to um, reproduce on its own, to consume uh, uh, food, to, uh, to uh, produce energy, to metabolize. metabolize. Viruses don't do anything of this. They are similar to the hair on our head. 
as simple as that. You put it there, it stays there. It replicates not on its own through our cells. And if, if you remember this fact, you would realize that if you wash your hands, keep a mask on your face, there's no, there's no real risk for that thing is to transmit and go. So on, on a string, definitely not. Thank you. Um, will the kindergarten toilets need to be cleaned after each child uses it? And who will do this cleaning? So this is perhaps a school board. If Dr. Ari can talk about the need for cleanliness, and I don't know if the school board wants to jump in about the last part, uh, who will do the cleaning? So the, the uh, recommendations is to uh, disinfect or clean toilets uh, twice a day, or as much as we can after a high risk use. So Again, I'm not talking about toilets here. If you're talking about toys that are favorable to little kids, those are high touch uh, areas, door handles. Uh, the toilet itself is, is not an item that we touch and we touch our face. Uh, unless you have that scenario, you don't really need to clean it after every use. Um, twice a day and whenever it's uh, um, you know, possible, that, that would be great. But there is no real risk with using a toilet and worrying about using it a second time if it's being used without, uh, you know, touching the toilet and touching somebody's face. And Ian, just in terms of who's responsible for the cleaning of the washrooms, that would be our custodial staff. And um, particularly in kindergarten rooms, if there's been an accident of any sort, because it does happen uh, staff would just call the custodian to support that, the cleaning part. Perfect. Thanks, Thanks so much. Um, next question is, I'm curious about uh, Dr. Ayer's thoughts about our place in the community once schools open. Considering that we'll have so many points of contact, 600 plus at school, should we be trying to limit our interactions in the community? Specifically, my hockey league is preparing to run a 50-person league. Should others in the league be concerned about a person with so many contacts participating with them? So again, the less contact in schools and out schools, the less risk of transmission. However, we need to balance this with the other one, the need for socialization and the need for kids to do what they uh, need to do to, to not have that mental uh, health situation that could be dire down the road in the long term or in the short term. Uh, the balance between them is essential. If everything stays the same and we have favorable epidemiology and there are no outbreaks in schools, there are sporadic cases in the community, however they're controlled, that's a scenario that would allow our kids to benefit from uh, both um, important issues. One, to have environment with low risk of transmission and the second one, environment that will provide them with social contact and social well-being. Uh, well-being, sorry. So all in all, it, it's not one or or the other. It's never binary. It's a level of risk that's evaluated all the time. Perfect. Thank you. Um, the next few questions that I have here, um, I, perhaps the school board may want to jump in to answer them first. And Dr. Era, uh, if you want to provide some context uh, to the response at the end, uh, that might work. And please, school board, if, if you would like Dr. Era to jump at the question first, please just let us know and uh, he will do so for sure. Um, so when indoors, is physical distancing sufficient or should staff be wearing a mask all the time? Sorry, Ian, is that when indoors or outdoors? Indoors. Um, staff are to wear a mask at all times indoors. Perfect. Thank you very and, much. And, and sorry, Ian, and that's definitely the recommendation of science. There is, uh, th that's a better practice regardless of distance from other kids or, or other people. Perfect. This next question, uh, same thing, does quite relate to the previous question, but is it possible to remove a mask but keep a face shield on while teaching in front of the room with students more than two meters away? Uh, it is not recommended because the droplets can get underneath the face shield. So we're encouraging people to wear their mask and their sh um, shield if they feel they need that double, double layer. I know that there are some teaching staff that are concerned about, for example, they teach French immersion, the ability for students to see their lips 
lips and mouth when they're teaching and we're looking at accessing masks with the windows um, so that it wouldn't be necessary to move their mask uh, during class time and, and kids could still see their mouths. And, and that's definitely the, the better practice and the recommendation. And it's worth mentioning the face shield protects the person wearing it from uh, infection through the high mucosa. So it does not protect the people in front of the person, uh, similar to the face mask. Thank you. Uh, the next two questions are specifically looking at uh, adding physical barriers or plexiglass um, uh, around teachers' desks uh, or students' desks. Um, from the school board's perspective, can you comment on the ask of can bar these barriers be installed or not? Uh, we have provided uh, plexiglass in school offices. Um, and it is um, physically installed. We are providing uh, portable plexiglass barriers for meeting rooms or guidance rooms that are small and make distancing very difficult. Um, we are not providing plexiglass to put around students or to put at teachers' desks. We believe we've got all of the layering of the PPE and the cleaning that's required. I, I totally support this statement and it has been, you know, evaluated with our team before. And, and just to, rem to remind people that, you know, to, to reduce the risk of transmission to zero uh, is, is, again, you need to put the person in the trunk of their car and leave them there. That's the only way you can reduce it to zero. It's very similar to uh, heat and, and cold. If the school has a heating system and the windows are closed, there is no need to put three layers of, of coat on every child. As a matter of fact, it might be detrimental to their health. Similarly, with these barriers in between kids, it's a really nifty idea that if we put a barrier around every person and put them in a little room, that's going to reduce the risk of transmission significantly. However, their social interaction and education has not been uh, achieved. Thank you very much. Um, and the next question again, because it's more related to the structures of the classroom, I think Dr. Ayer, you'll be able to add some context, but also looking at uh, the school board for some input to this question. I teach a grade two, three class. My kids may or may not have masks on. I do not have individual desks, but mo rather multi-seat desks. The farthest apart I can have students sit is about two feet. What would you suggest I do to achieve this basic? Thanks, Ian. We've asked um, staff to work directly with their principals in order to look at how to best accommodate the need for the distancing in the class if there's a challenge such as this one. And so I would encourage that staff member to talk to their principal. There's been some very creative solutions that have been suggested uh, to staff to find the, the strategies to address this. Uh, so I, I, I'm not comfortable giving a pat answer to this when there may be different strategies in that particular school that could be achieving the same end. Yeah, I think I cannot add anything to your, your answer, Cynthia. I, I definitely would echo that. It's uh, depending on the facility, depending on the class, the age, it has to be custom fit for each scenario. Regardless, just remember that the distance is one layer of many layers of protection. Thank you very much. Um, this next question actually um, is a very common one that we've had multiple times, not particular to schools, but in other environments. But why can singing not happen indoors while wearing a mask? Um, so I don't know if the school board wants to, to chime in, but Dr. Ayer, you can also talk about the risk of singing too. Yeah, definitely. So singing is a very high risk activity. It's very similar to coughing, probably more, just because it goes for longer. Um, so, so having that activity indoors, uh, even with a mask, is, is still not uh, something that, uh, from risk point of view, is, is uh, uh, preferable. If you look at singing in churches, for example, and the spiritual for people, and they say there is, you know, to many people, it's it's very important to the individual. It it could be balanced with the distance among people, and 
again, in schools, if this is an activity from education point of view, that's very important to certain kids. Could it be done in in a modified way? It could be, but it's not going to be. Uh, there's not going to be equity to all kids to be able to sing in bigger uh, choir or bigger groups. Uh, my recommendation is to shy away from it as much as we can. Danny, and that's what we've recommended. No singing yeah. at this time. Perfect, thank you. you. Can, but you can always sing inside your head, which is far better for me because I always sing out of tune anyway. <sighs> Wonderful. Um, so how I eat, so this is a staff question, how I eat in a very small staff room that is provided for about 30 to 35 staff members. Um, so I think that's a question for the board, but also Dr. Ara may, perhaps you can provide some context to that response. So we have advised all schools to plan for their staff room, to look at the um, loading factor for it, how many people can be in there and distance and to coordinate in that regard. Um, but we would not expect all staff to be in a small staff room at the same time. Yeah, definitely, that's that's exactly what we discussed when we planned this. If you recall from the dim dark past of half an hour ago, I mentioned there are different variables we look at. One of them is the number of people within an activity and the number of time, the length of time that they're interacting. So if if people can go to use these spaces in shifts or they prefer to eat in separate spaces. Again, there are many strategies to reduce risk. And, and a clear example is the health unit here where I am right now. We have not shut down during the emergency. And there are people who use a small kitchenette or a kitchen. And we have these rules to disinfect more, to use uh, the, the area with hand washing and, and not to be in, in great numbers. And uh, again, it's quite manageable. Thank you very much. Um, so the next uh, question is in regard to activity outdoors. Um, the number of students on the schoolyard will be restricted. Will students be allowed to play with students from another class? And what distance do students who play together need to maintain? And can students bring things like a soccer ball uh, to school? And if I can just say, Ian, that um, the recommendation to schools is to have a plan so that cohorts are zoned in the yard. Um, and I know there's certainly a concern of both parents and staff about the distancing outside. Certainly the students don't need to wear their masks outside and we don't want to um, have them sitting on the ground doing nothing. Um, I think it's a, an educational piece for working with the students to understand the need to distance where they can and protect themselves. That, that's definitely the right balance. If we restrict that activity, um, the kids will be missing out on, on something that's, uh, that's very important for their mental health. And if we just step back and remember the uh, evidence that uh, was uh, confirmed after protests, Black Lives Matter, um, there is enough evidence that outdoor activities uh, are, are way safer than indoors activities. Uh, in, in Wyerton and on sound, local ev evidence has shown that we had a protest of over a thousand in on sound. We waited three, four weeks, five weeks. Every case that occurred during that period of time was investigated whether there's a link to the protest or somebody in their bubble was linked to the protest and there wasn't. And even if all that investigation yield you know, information that's not reliable, we, we're not gonna believe these cases, they're actually were in the protest. The number of cases generated around that time was not significant in any way. So again, we can deprive our kids from all the social interaction and the play in a um, playground or, or uh, outdoors, but that's that's really not the scientific or the reasonable uh, direction based on the facts we have. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, I, I believe, we'll probably both be able to add some uh, responses to this. I'll, I'll look to the school board first. Um, how can we best support students' mental health as we return to school that will be a very different environment in so many ways? How might the many practices instituted for meeting the important protocols impact students' social skill development and their overall mental health currently and in the future? 
So thanks very much, Ian. And um, I am going to take a risk here and ask Reen Langan, who is our mental health lead, and she's on the call. Um, she's taken a significant amount of her personal time to prepare our mental health training for all of our staff, which will be provided in the next two days. And she's worked directly with the resources from School Mental Health Ontario. But Reen, do you want to comment on this? Because you're the resident expert. Hi, everyone. It's great to connect with you. However, I'm doing a little bit of sidebar stuff, including with a family member right now. So I'd be very grateful if you'd repeat the question, please. Reen, would you like to share um, uh, with the group here how we're providing mental health supports for students on their return to school? Yeah, we've had a like we've had a lot of extensive conversations over the summer. We've also provided mental health support over the summer. We have two mental health workers in secondary schools and myself as a mental health lead. And we're coordinating and trying to identify and respond to the needs of all of our students. We're very grateful for our community partners. Big shout out to Keystone. They've been doing a lot of remote uh, counseling as well doing an exceptional job connecting with family health teams, which we, I think we need to use more of. Through CMHA, we're using their um, choices counselors as well, who have been working remotely. And we also have the mental health and addiction nurses through the Southwest Lynn. So we've all been kind of banding together and we're all on board and we're all doing what we can to make sure that our children are looked after, our students are looked after, and that no one gets missed, no one falls through the cracks. So it's really important that families know that to us, uh, for us, that we are there for them and we will coordinate all our services to help them navigate pathways to care. Thanks, Reen. And if I can add to that, in, in bringing our students back to school, uh, I believe one of the things that Reen has outlined um, in the training is that first we have to acknowledge the return um, and that that is a challenge. We have to bridge the gap um, for our students in the transition back to school and we have to, to connect and reconnect with our students. And the first 10 days are really important in that regard. Um, there will be resources available to staff. There's resources available to administrators, to school staff, and also to parents and community, and that will all be um, shared with all the necessary people in order to support the student's return from a mental health perspective. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, so the next one also, I believe it's, it's mostly for the, the school board and Dr. Era, feel free to add some context to um, the response as well, but. What are the best practices for physical education classes? Can we still use shared supplies like basketballs, volleyball, soccer balls, badminton rackets and birdies, etc., as long as they are disinfected and kids disinfect their hands before and after use? How do you recommend sanitizing shared physical education equipment? Is it the teacher's or custodian's responsibility to sanitize the used physical education equipment? Thanks, Ian. And um, uh, we would appreciate more input from Dr. Ayer on this one because we're still getting questions. And I think it's on our agenda for the meeting tomorrow about the use of the gym, um, but also the equipment, the, the number of touch the touch points by students um, in, in terms of the use of that equipment. We had a question today about um, soccer in the yard outside um, and not throwing the ball in but allowing the students to kick it around the field uh, without picking it up. Um, the one thing I can say for sure is that it's not the custodians who clean the, clean the phys ed equipment. Phys ed is a, is a program um, and piece and that is done by um, teaching staff or support staff in that regard. So I'll let Dr. Era comment on the rest. Thank you. So um, the, the, what you mentioned is, seems very, very reasonable in practice. Anything outdoors is encouraged and less risk. Not picking the, the ball, that, that will be optimal. Uh, cleaning, disinfecting the equipment before and after is necessary. Uh, it, usually in every gym, you know, you, you tell people to clean after themselves. You know, it, it's doable. Clean before themselves 
that's even more doable. Uh, there are certain activities that are high risk. Running on a treadmill, person panting, that's again, higher risk of transmission. So these type of activities would be discouraged. However, in general, uh, the, the risk in, in uh, FISAT is, is less than the risk in other settings. Many people think that's not intuitive or, or not straightforward, but it is. Um, disinfection uh, twice a day, uh, similar to anything else, is the basics. However, uh, the more we do, the more disinfection we, we have or the more cleaning, the better washing our hands. Again, what, like that's what our mothers taught us, and this is what really carried us through the first wave. It is essential, and, and if we um, ask our kids, our students, ask ourselves to be mindful of this, to develop a habit within the first two weeks of the school year, every, every person who would be mindful of this can develop a habit that becomes automatic and protects them, protect the, their families and, and the community. Um, again, uh, specifics about the gym would be evaluated as we go and will be approved when it is safe. Um, the outdoors is always better than in the indoors. And, and just for the benefit of one question on, on a chat box, outdoors, you don't need a mask unless you're really in a crowded group. That's the only time I would think of a mask outside. Otherwise, it's not needed. And I, I could just say, Dr. Era, that sometimes staff that are on supervision uh, have to get up very close to students and a mask may on occasion be required. So I would certainly encourage people to carry it with them in that if, if that event should occur. Oh, definitely. And that's a crowded situation if, if there are different people uh, and it's not controlled. The crowded comes from the fact that you cannot control who's going to be, be beside you and, and you're getting close to people. Uh, having a mask uh, in one's pocket is, is not or in a bag in one's pocket is, is uh, recommended. Thank you very much. Um, this next question is uh, more for you, or definitely for you, Dr. Air. I did uh, skip over it um, by accident, um, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to respond to it or not, but uh, the question is, infectious disease specialist Dr. Abdu Charkawi recently rated common school activities based on how risky they are in the pandemic, and there is a link to a news article. Um, according to, to him, uh, eating in the classroom has been deemed as a high risk activity, yet elementary students in Blue Water School Board are being are expected to eat in their classrooms. How can we minimize the risk within our classrooms during nutrition breaks? I believe you're still muted, sorry. Thank you, thank you. Uh, with all due respect, the person who made that statement, the physician, uh, eating is not high risk activity unless people are eating from the same popcorn ball, uh, ball and, and they're touching uh, the same uh, item. It's not high risk activity. It's important to uh, look at the specialty that's making the evaluation. If you're going to ask a, a, a physician about the brain surgery, I would go to a brain surgeon. Infectious disease is a specialty to deal with patients, individual patients, to do assessment, to prescribe antibiotic, to admit to hospital, to manage. It is not the specialty to evaluate the risk in a setting. If it is occupational setting, you would go to occupational medicine specialist. If it's a risk in the community and schools, it is PHPM, Public Health Preventative Medicine. There is a fellowship of five years training in it. In the States, it's four years. Both qualification are quite comparable. If you need information and facts, you would go to Public Health Agency of Canada, CDC, Atlanta, Center of Disease Control. And any, if you're going to take it from, get it from, uh, sorry, I, I missed the, the uh, source of the um, information, which media outlet. If you're going to go to media, not academic, be mindful of finding PHPM after the the uh, um, qualification or the name of the physician, public health preventative medicine, public health and preventative medicine specialty. And again, it's, it's uh, less an optimal situation where you would find different physicians commenting on management of outbreak. There's a difference between managing one patient and managing a group or a situation. And, and uh, the College of Physicians of Surgeons actually has been looking into this 
because some people, some physicians make statement with all good heart and intention to serve the public. However, that's based on limited uh, qualification and limited ability to evaluate risk. Back to the question, eating is not high risk activity. Uh, rather, it is low, depending on the situation there, of course. Thank you very so much. I think, Ian, um, thank you for there with that. We've reached 8.30, which was our timeline. So I wonder if we can take the remaining questions from uh, your list and from the chat boxes and get responses out um, at a later date for those. Because we did say 7 to 8.30. Absolutely. I, I'm very comfortable with uh, with facilitating that. That's not, a, not an issue at all. So those of you who question, have questions in the chat box, we'll get responses uh, for you with those. And if Ian, I, I think Ian, probably you're very close to the end of your list just based on my memory of the questions that came in. So we can um, certainly follow up with those as well. Yes, I just got through them all. Thank you. Excellent. You're very good. Thanks. <laughs> um, Dr. Era, do you have any closing comments that you would like to make? I just want to thank everybody around the room. Like that's the most important thing. Your efforts has saved all of us, have saved our community and the, the most vulnerable of us. And I again, I want to reassure the public and the group here, the, the school officials that are leading your organizations have invested every ounce of energy to make it safe for you, for the kids and for the community. And I attest to it firsthand over the past four or five months. And again, Cynthia said she's sending emails at night. I know she sent emails two in the morning and, and uh, after. And, and again, that's one example of many people who are taking care of the situation. And, and we're all in this together. Um, we're here to support and provide information as we go forward. Thank you very much, Dr. Eric. We appreciate that. And Lori, did you have any closing comments? I did, yes. Thanks, Cynthia. I would also like to extend many thanks to you, Dr. R, for generously donating your time and expertise this evening uh, to enable us to offer this session for our Blue Water staff. Thanks, Ian, for moderating and uh, to the staff from Gray Bruce Public Health to supporting this evening's session. Thanks also to you, Cynthia and Jamie Pettit and our other staff in Blue Water who were involved in coordinating and facilitating the session. Since it is being recorded, we look forward to sharing it with others within Blue Water who were unable to attend this evening. There's so much for us to think about as we prepare to adapt to our new normal in Blue Water with all of the new protocols that are being implemented. And it's really helpful for us to have the guidance, support and reassurance of our local public health partners during these challenging times. I know there are still questions and though I speak for all Blue Water staff, when I say that we are extremely lucky to have Dr. Ara and his team in our corner and helping us through this process. Thank you all for being here with us this evening and take good care and wishing you all the very best as our school year begins. Thanks. Thanks very much, Laurie. And thank you to everyone who was here again this evening. Uh, those of you that have outstanding questions or comments, we will get information to you shortly. Uh, and thank you again very much, Dr. Ara. I have a sneaking suspicion you missed uh, bedtime tuck in tonight um, so that I, I I hope that your daughter will forgive us for taking you away from her this evening but thank you for uh, all your care and attention to Blue Water it's much appreciated. So good night everyone if uh, for those of you that aren't home safe trip home and uh, we'll chat again another day. Bye now. Bye everyone thanks so much.